Kasami, Deputy Minister of National Unity, as well as Patron yeah. to Malaysian Dr. Ambeka Welfare Organization, His Excellency Mr. D.N. Reddy, High Commissioner of India to Malaysia, our esteemed guest Dr. Bimrao Ambeka, grandson of Dr. Ambeka, I think. Let us give him a round of welcoming applause. To our own speed, Tiagaran, patron of the Malaysian Dr. Ambekar Welfare Organization, Dr. Dato Banchamukti, President of the Malaysian Dr. Ambekar Welfare Organization, Herman Sate, International Coordinator, International and Local Delegates, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. A very good evening to all of you. I came upon this uh, event by a very happy coincidence. In February this year, if Your Excellency remember, <coughs> I had the opportunity to lunch with uh, His Excellency E.M. Reddy, and uh, we spoke on many issues, on human resource management, uh, on skills training, relation between Malaysia and India and I spoke about because I'm from Penang an hour flight away north of Kuala Lumpur for our foreign guests I spoke about the visit of the great Rabindrana Tagore to Penang about 100 years ago and then I told His Excellency that I have come during my university days to admire one Dr. B. R. M. Baker, though that was my comment to him, he was relatively little known here in Malaysia. And then, like how Prophet Elijah of old was corrected of his self presumptuousness, His Excellency immediately enlightened my naivete. He said, There are others too here in Malaysia who admire Dr. M. Baker, and they even organized conferences around him. And one of them, he told me, is uh, my honourable colleague, Senator Saraswati Kandasamy, the Deputy Minister for National Unity. And she is, of course, the patron of the Dr. Ambekar Welfare Organisation here in Malaysia. Up until then, I had only read writings by and of Dr. Ambekar and had no idea that such an organisation existed here in Malaysia. What a wonderful discovery. Congratulations to the Dr. America Welfare Organization. And of course, one thing led to another, and eventually I was invited to this very meaningful conference. Through the effort of Senator Saraswati, I also had the privilege to contribute a little bit of financial support to the organizing part. My dear friends, how do we praise or even appraise someone like Dr. M. Baker. He hated hero worship and even lamented the practice of sucking up to politicians in his days. In most stories I read about Ambeka, he is the anti-hero, anti-hero, seen as an agitator more than a leader, a provocator more than a protagonist, a zealot more than a saint, tolerated only by the forbearance of the elite, doomed to fail from the beginning, but nonetheless demonstrated what philosopher Slavoj Zizek called the courage of hopelessness to persevere towards his reform agenda against the despairing condition of his time. And such is the object of our discussion. How do we even how do we even begin to talk about this man? It is of course a good fortune that I have previously read a lecture by Dr. Ambekar delivered in 1943 in honour of the 101st birthday anniversary of Justice Mahadev Robin Renade. Oh, I pronounced the name correctly. Perhaps I shall borrow the outline of his speech in the centenary honour of Justice Renade to articulate our own centennial honour unto this man. First and foremost, Dr. Ambekar was a man of great intellect. 
despite the immense hardship in majority due to the grave injustice of being discriminated against by the factor of his birth, Dr. Ambeka managed by his own industrious efforts to graduate from top universities in America and in the United Kingdom in economics, finance, laws, etc. His writings on diverse and difficult topics, whether economics, social politics, ethnology, history, or even theology, demonstrated brilliant scholarship. And to me personally, they were very elucidating, to say the least. Just pick any of his essays or speeches. One will find the breadth and width of his knowledge with him citing various ancient and modern thinkers from the East to the West, and then complementing them with the depth of his own analysis and clarity of thoughts. No one can argue that Dr. Ambeka lacked intellect, not even his political adversary. In his own words, expressing the astonishment at being appointed to the narrow cabinet, Ambeka said this, I was in the opposite camp and had already been condemned as unworthy of association when the interim government was formed in August 1946. Yet, despite being seen as an antagonist to the new government at that time, he was appointed law minister and tasked to the historic role of writing the constitution of India. This is a perfect illustration how even those who disagreed with him acknowledge his great intellectual merits. And secondly, Ambeka was an honest and sincere man. In at least two of his speeches, in my very limited reading, Ambeka bluntly expressed his unwillingness to accept the original invitation for him to speak. One was the 1943 lecture on Justice Renade that I mentioned, and the other was, of course, the famous speech titled today, Annihilation of Caste, which was supposed to be delivered at the Jat Par Toda Mandal 1936 conference in Lahore. Of course, the, the speech was undelivered because the conference was eventually cancelled. But in the script, Dr. Ambeka unapologetically said, I have accepted the invitation much against my very own will. How rare is such frankness among invited guests and speakers who dare to even sound impertinent just to speak the truth. In fact, the reason for the cancellation of the conference was because Ambeka refused, in his own word again, to alter even a comma after being asked by the organizer after he was being asked by the organizers to tone down on certain part of his criticism, this is a man who would rather be honest than be honored. A sincere man cares for principles and not for position or power, which is why Ambeka was willing to resign from the ministerial position coveted by many even today when the Nehru government backtracked on certain reforms pertaining to religion and the caste system. In his parliamentary speech explaining his resignation, Dr. Ambega said, and again his word, my exit from the cabinet may not be a matter of much concern to anybody in this country, but I must be true to myself and that can only be by going out. Such is the stance of a sincere and honest man. Thirdly, Dr. Mbekar was a social reformer in the truest sense of the word. In fact, he argued in many of his writings that social reforms must be prior to political reforms. This, however, could be misconstrued as meaning Dr. Mbekar did not care for politics and prioritized social issues. There is nothing further than the truth than such false thinking. In fact, it was very clear that Ambekar talked, when he talked about social reforms, he meant political actions to ensure liberty, equality, and fraternity. He knew that 
that the biggest problem of the oppressed class, or rather, more accurately, caste, was not the mere poverty of property, but rather the poverty of power. He recognized that beyond the performative rituals against the oppressed, such as the Dalits were required to wear a pot around their neck, lest their saliva falls and pollute the earth, or tie a broom behind them to sweep the ground off their wretched footprints. All these, he said, are performative rituals because it was really in the denial of political rights which entrapped the oppressed into a fate of eternal servitude. In his own words, and I quote him, the only answer which I can give to that situation, and it is that the lower caste has been completely disabled for direct action on account of this wretched caste system. They could receive no education. They could not think out or know the way to their salvation. They were condemned to be lowly and not knowing the way of escape and not having the means of escape. They became reconciled to eternal servitude, which they accepted as their inescapable fate. Those of you who are familiar with that famous passage from Annihilation of Cars will notice that I deliberately remove the violent section of that famous quote because I fear it will inspire a misunderstood message in today's context of a live wire society where everyone is ever ready to erupt at the slightest provocation. But one ought to be reminded, however, of the violence which Ambekar and his community had to endure within the caste system where perhaps the only way out for them at that time was through equally radical action. Ambekar's politics was social reform. Even his religion was social reform. So committed was Ambekar to the idea of universal equality that he dedicated a chapter in his treatise on Buddhism to the conversion of the low and the lowly of Upali the barber, of Sunita the sweeper, of Sopaka and Supiya the untouchables, of Sumangangla the peasant, and of Supra Buddha the leper. This was of course Ambika's way to contrast the universal equality of all men and women which he believed in against the practice of caste discrimination he was born into. And if you read his treaty on Buddhism, I love it. I'm not a Buddhist, but I love it. <coughs> Employing the classic Indian dialectics, Dr. Ambekar presented a 15-point argument on the idea of equality in Buddhism. Beginning with premise number one, men are born unequal. That's his premise number one. Men are born unequal. Notice, he would not have any of the mystical idealism of Americanism preferring to be grounded by the reality of experience. And then he proceeded by asking, should this rule of inequality where survival of the fittest be allowed as the rule of life? Only to answer his own interlocution by saying, Equality may help the best to survive, even though the best may not be the fittest. And what our society wants is the best, not the fittest. Finally, reaching his grand conclusion at premise number 15, he said, This was the viewpoint of the Buddha, and it was because of this that he, the Buddha, argued that a religion that which not preach equality is not worth having. He was fiercely committed to universal equality despite the crushing weight of tradition stacked against him. In his own words describing Renade, borrowing from Lord Rosebery, speaking about Napoleon, Ambeka, Ambeka was a scourge and scavenger born to cleanse society and lead it on the right path, who is engaged in best operation, partly positive mainly negative, but all relating to social regeneration. My dear friends, with these three ingredients, immense intellect, 
great sincerity and commitment towards reform, we must then conclude of Dr. Ambeka just as he did of Justice Renade in his speech in 1943. Thus, is a great man. We are here, my dear friends, tonight to honour a great man. And as we are halfway into this third decade of the 21st century, the world is faced with multiple crises, from war to trade war, from global pandemics to global climate change. As our generation grapples with these challenges, perhaps Dr. Ambika offered a path towards salvation. A salvation not consisting of mysticism, not of otherworldliness, but precisely because he was firmly rooted in the world, contemplating, nay, experiencing worldly crisis. His meditation to reconstruct a better world can help us in our own endeavor. I'm delighted to be among learned admirers of Dr. Ambekar, and I'm honored, Malaysia is definitely honored and proud to host this conference. I welcome all of you, especially our foreign friends. I wish you a fruitful conference tomorrow. Finally, finally. What then shall we admirers and students of Ambekar do? Again, I think no better can I say than Baba Sahib himself. This is my paraphrase of his speech on Justice Ranade, which I introduced earlier. The original speech referred to the action or direction ought to be taken by the liberal followers of Justice Ranade. Here, I borrow Baba Sahib's own words to show the way forward for us. It follows that if we have faith in and love and respect for Ambeka, our supreme duty lies not merely in assembling together to sing his praises, but in organizing ourselves for the spreading of the gospel of Ambeka. <laughs> Baba Sahib himself warned us that if the caste question is not resolved, when Indians travel abroad, they will only bring the Indian domestic problems to new location. But what he, in his humility perhaps, cannot anticipate is how when students of Ambedkar, like yourself, travel abroad, you bring his vision of a better world everywhere you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Senior Sujito, for the continuity speech. Dear Honorable Senior Sujito, please thank you in your stage for the participation to all the VIP guests in the front table. We are going to invite them to be on stage for the continuity session.